All right, today we're going to talk a little bit more about the Squatterman Plasma Apocalypse. And I want to make sure everybody knows just how important uh, plasma physicist Dr. Anthony Peratt is to this whole thing. Uh, he was a plasma physicist at Los Alamos, which is one of the most top secret government, you know, bases. And he was doing experiments with uh, confined, magnetically confined plasma. And uh, some of the patterns that he found while doing this, he was uh, kind of discussing some things with a friend of his. I think his name was David Talbot. And David Talbot realized that these images, especially this squatting man that you see there on the top left, um, <clears throat> one image is the experiment and then the concept and then highlighting different areas of it. And across the world, this image is found on rocks everywhere, petroglyphs. And so Anthony Peratt uh, couldn't believe that somebody had seen these patterns before. <clears throat> so he documented by going to, I don't know, over 70 countries or over 100 countries, a lot of different countries, and mapping every petroglyph by longitude and latitude every longitude and latitude every one that would uh, match any of these patterns he got from doing the experiments with uh, plasma which is ionized gas electromagnetically excited air uh, and <clears throat> there ended up being like 80 different categories and one of the most common ones was this stick figure, this squatting man, a lot of times with two dots on either side of him, and it's been called the squatter man. And it's found in over a hundred countries and, you know, just thousands and thousands of, of images of this same thing. So um, Anthony Pratt continued comparing these petroglyphs to these uh, results he was getting from plasma in a, in a confined in a magnetic field. And you can see, you know, different images he was getting during this evolution of this uh, plasma, right, as different as it went through different intensities and Brooklyn currents and Z pinches and just uh, different um, stages of evolution and intensity. Uh, it, it made different formations and <clears throat> all of these things uh, the ancient people saw in the sky. And it was like, you know, glowing neon. I mean, neon is plasma, lightning is plasma. But if it was sustained and following magnetic fields, it would create images in the sky. So they were seeing this, interpreting it at different stages as these X's you see. Or, you know, earlier there were some owls or you can see an hourglass. And <clears throat> before these different toroids pinch off in things, uh, they form these columns. And... You can see all over there are petroglyphs of this kind of, they call it either like a caterpillar or a ladder. And uh, it's all, you know, the same uh, forms were found when Anthony Pratt was doing experiments with plasma confining to magnetic fields. And you can see here how sometimes it can almost, uh, it can give like a, a, a as the, uh, toroid starts forming. Uh, it can look like a duck head at the top. Uh, some people also see this funnel as like a, a, a bot, like a mermaid, uh, like a bottom of a mermaid, right? It all depends on your perspective, right? Because if I'm on one side of the room and you're on the other, there's a six in the middle. One of us is going to see a six, the other nine. And depending on if there was anything obstructing the view or where you were at, like longitude wise or latitude wise, you're going to see different things. So uh, at different discharges, different patterns that happen, uh, different, um, uh, different, they match up exactly with petroglyphs. And what some people would think was a ram's head or a goat or whatever uh, on these ancient petroglyphs is really this like this shockwave formation, right? And those feet, uh, those uh, the lightning bolts coming down, splitting into three, look like the pitchfork or like Ish Ishtar's uh, legs, right? They, a lot of these uh, ancient Babylonian gods have the the chicken legs, right? Or the yeah the claws. And here we see the shockwave again and recorded on a petroglyph. But the cool thing, really, the thing that sticks out to me is these. Uh, Berkelin currents have 
uh, filament into exactly 56 points. And the outer ring of Stonehenge has 56 uh, stones. And if he, he's also, he, he see, Peratt has a database where he can like search for petroglyphs with 56 rings or 56 dots, right? And based on that number 56, there are so many petroglyphs that align exactly, whether you're in Washington or Arizona. And he took that and kind of laid them over each other to show how exact they are. And they all, ha- they all have 56 uh, dots. There's so many petroglyphs with exactly 56 dots. And, he, and then he overlaid it over Stonehenge and everything too, right? So he's got this database of over probably 100 countries of I don't know how many thousands of petroglyphs uh, basically sorted by computer intelligence and AI pretty much into 80 different categories uh, of petroglyphs that match these uh, plasma discharges and these these different instabilities that happen while uh, uh, plasma is going through different intensities and evolving in a, in a magnetic field. And so I found another website that kind of put some stuff, stuff like this together, uh, comparing all of these uh, petroglyphs that you find all over the world to each other, showing how similar a lot of them are and they're they seem nonsensical and the mainstream will try to tell you oh they were just you know high on mushrooms or something right Mm -hmm. but he can even kind of pointed out some other things with the different uh basically there's some that are more visible than others some that have worn away more than others so this looks from two different events. So it could be cyclical, right? And I've kind of posited sometimes that it's every 13,000 years. Um, but who knows how often these uh, petroglyphs are scratched in the same spot as ones were in the past. But <clears throat> if we look at the various stages of plasmoid development, you can see first the filament sheath twists into a string. And on the right, you see a petroglyph that looks exactly like that. What else could they be depicting, right? Why would they, they had to see something crazy in the air based on all this evidence and the research of Anthony Peratt, right? So then it twists and you see on the right hand side, there's an exact petroglyph that matches that too, right? And just more examples. A lot of times these, uh, these toroids that, that, that form during this um, plasma development, at max, there will be nine of these spheres, so there's never more than nine. Uh, sometimes they're seen with a little less, but they always max out at nine. And uh, you'll see these little toroids or these balls depicted in a lot of uh, petroglyphs. Now, here is a representation on top of an aurora borealis uh, or the northern lights, uh, which was quite prominent in Norway in October of 1868. And kind of match that up with... Um, uh, and a Native American headdress, right? And a lot of these headdresses have uh, 56 feathers, right? So something electromagnetically excited the air, changed it to plasma, it started following magnetic field lines. It's similar to what happens with the Northern Lights, Aurora Borealis, only way more intense, right? And you can see, depending on what part of this uh, formation you're looking at, uh, you can see an eye and a nose or a mask or an X pattern, and just all these different interpretations of this uh, Chandraskahar Fermi uh, equation that basic, and you can find it on ancient pottery, petroglyphs. Uh, this stuff just gets passed down. And here's various tropes on the squatter man, and especially on the two on the left, top and bottom, and the one in the middle too. You can see those toroids being represented, those little balls that were in that sheath where it's like, you know, they max out at nine. And Just these squatting figures and seen from different uh, angles and different cultural interpretations, uh, different periods of intensity, people interpret it in different ways, right? And here's uh, a better picture of the shockwave, right? And you can find these shockwave patterns that happen uh, with plasma in documented on petroglyphs on rocks, uh, you know, in California, uh, Utah. There's so much of this in the Southwest, and I think the reason being is because this this event has to be devastating, right? Because it's basically like mega super lightning, right? Uber lightning, and it's gonna, you know, 
whatever it comes in contact with, even if it's the ground, it's going to superheat the ground so much that just like a, a, a pan on a stove, right, the heat spreads and it's going to melt things from the bottom up. Or if it hits it directly from the top, it's going to melt it from the top up. And I think a lot of mountains are formed this way from electric discharge, basically pulling up and hardening uh, after liquefying uh, a bunch of earth, right? And some of those formations used to be, you know, giant buildings. And just um, this this plasma, this it, it does generate ultraviolet and X-ray radiation with the intensity that it, you know, not only would blind anyone, so, you know, you can't look directly at the glory, don't look back, right? But could kill any life forms exposed to it. So, uh, were the people who were drawing this basically uh, already dead of radiation? And uh, did, uh, I guess, enough people got underground to, to survive, right? But here you see the spheroids or the toruses, and they can be depicted in different ways. But uh, whether you're in Utah or Crete, and whether it's a petroglyph or some kind of religious iconography, you find the same thing. This This central figure with its arms raised, and uh, a lot of times holding uh, two snakes or two poles uh, or two animals to represent uh, a lot of times that serpentine energy, right? And, you know, um, Moses, the sticks and the serpents, I don't know, just kind of interesting, right? But this, when this plasma is going through the air, it's going to move like a serpent. So I think a lot of these ancient depictions of serpents are hearkening back to this plasma event, right? So even with Ishtar here, we have a little, uh, what is that, an ohm symbol? Almost looks like a magnet, right? And the chicken feet that look like uh, branching electricity, but Ishtar was ruby-eyed, heartless, evil, surrounded by death and disaster, clothed in radiance like a dragon. She deposited venom on foreign lands. Vegetation could not stand up to her, uh, raining blazing fire down upon the land, uh, vegetation there is ruined, set afire. So <clears throat> this doesn't sound like a god they're worshiping, right? It sounds like a um, an event, right? Um, a plasma apocalypse, so to speak, right? <clears throat> and you can see it talks about, <clears throat> just like in the Bible, where they talk about seeing the face of God. They talk about, hey, you can't look at it because of the glory. And just stories about not looking back, right? And... Um, it says, I approached the light, but the light was scorching hot to me. I approached that shade, but I was covered with a storm. And you see down at the bottom, you see this plasma sheath, and it looks an awful lot like a, a mix of what, you know, you could you could personify that as either one of those two things on the right or left you saw, right? Jesus, uh, the Buddha or uh, Mother Mary, right? But in conclusion, I mean, the Thunderbird, the Phoenix... Uh, the squatter man, uh, Odin on the tree, Jesus on the cross. Uh, what do you think it is? Do you think they're all myths or they're all talking about this this event where, you know, depending on your cultural lens, you can interpret it in many different ways, right? Well, tell me what you think about the uh, those questions. Give me your theories and make sure you uh, find more out about Anthony Peratt.